So why the need for this particular topic? Over the time, I realized that dealing and interacting with residents, you come across some of them who have spent so long in the program, especially having challenges with their dissertation or their proposal. And you ask them what the challenge is, and most of them, most of them will tell you, my supervisor said this, or they just put down all my work, and or it's not good enough, or and they have a lot of challenges. And I realize that a lot of the times they are not really focused or directed. So developing this research question for me is one of the most important aspects of developing a um, proposal. And if we can help them guide them in doing this, then they can own the research for themselves and also be able to um, do a good job of it. So for this presentation, we're gonna look out for what's a, a research question, what are the importance of setting out research questions, what are the features of a good question, what type of questions there are. And we're going to look a bit about how to de develop a good question and also evaluate a research question. So what's a research question? It's basically a clear, a focused and concise question which the research sets to, out to answer. So basically it's a question you're setting out to answer by your research. It's also very important in the way that it gives direction and focus for conducting the research. So in a way it sets the guidelines or the path for the research process so that you're, you are focused and then you don't go wandering around for too long. What's the purpose for doing this? It's to accomplish just two purposes, to answer a question that is yet to be answered or Maybe an answer may have been provided by somebody else, but the answer is contradictory. Or it may be that you, you the researcher, even wants to challenge the way that answer was, was, was provided. And so you can also go ahead and um, provide another answer to that same question. And so for our residents, especially uh, residents in training, why is it important to guide them to this? For me, I think it's important because it provides a guiding framework for the research. And usually when you come across, when they come up like that, it's, it's also a good guide to just say, just go give me three questions that you seek to answer with this research. Now, because they have to develop that question, they would need to think, they would need to think through their topic. Because like Paul said, they may have developed their topic, they are interested about it, they are passionate about it. And especially for our clinical doctors who may, they, that may be their, their trade. So they are really excited about it and they want to do novel research. But sometimes they need us to guide them and shape them. And one of the key things to do is to send them back and say, give me just one research, between one and three questions that you seek to answer by this research. Once you've given them that, that task, they'll be forced to think it through and make sure that those questions are relevant. And when they bring it back as, as supervisors, our, our, our role will be to guide them to find out, are these questions good enough? And if they are not good enough, we just guide them and show them how to modify them. It also helps narrow some topics that may be too broad so that it, it shapes it and focuses it so that they are researchable and they are within the boundaries of the, they keep between the boundaries of the study. So as much as possible, it's good to also guide them to set limits. So that at the end of the day, they don't go on a tangent, they start from one aspect, then they go and discover something in the literature review as they are doing the literature review. And they find that that's even more exciting than what they started off. Then they veer off on a tangent and then end up going back and forth. So at the end of the day, they get confused and not focused on their work. So it's very important that these questions also keep them in focus. It saves them time and energy and effort. So that at the end of the day, they don't waste their time doing unnecessary things. The research questions also provide a structure for the search of the literature. If you go Google or wherever, and you type anything, you're gonna to get uh, tons and tons of information, but you should be guided by what exactly you're gonna be looking for. You should be guided for by what information you need to look for. And these research questions guide them in searching for the most important questions to look out for. Then they can prioritize them as they do the literature search. So what constitutes a good question? First of all, it should be focused on a single problem or an issue. It should be, relevant, 
They should be relevant both academically and intellectually. It should make sense. There should be a reason why that question should be answered. Then questions should, should, should also be feasible. It should be feasible in scope and in scale. It should be realistic. It should be specific and it should be concise. And it should be clear. It shouldn't be answering vague questions, basically. It should be interesting or novel. Somebody should have a stake in the answer. So that at the end of the day, somebody, like if I, if I need to, if that question is answered, it's going to be providing some information of value to the nation at large and to the whole scientific uh, community. The research should be answerable. It should be researchable. You don't want to seek out questions that may not, you can't be able to provide an answer for. And finally, it should be ethical. So what do I mean by focus? So I'm gonna set up by asking three questions. Does insulin work? That has already been studied, but it's too broad. Then I further focus it and say, does insulin work in patients with diabetes? Even that is not focused enough because for all you know, I may be looking out for does insulin work in patients or does insulin reduce, is, is insulin effective in reducing blood sugar among patients with diabetes? Or I could even be asking another question, does insulin reduce mortality when used in the treatment of patients with diabetes? So as much as possible in guiding our students or our residents in shaping their research topics, it's very important they come out with specific, clear, focused question. They can start abroad, but then as they, they narrow down to their, their topics of interest, let's help them narrow it down. That helps them make it achievable and is also um, more focused so that they don't go running around to town. Another thing we need to look out for in this research question is the fact that is it specific? Is it concise? Is it clear? And you can imagine somebody walking up with your question. What are the negative effects of choosing OBGYN as a specialty? I know Prof. Adon won't be <laughs> happy with me. But then the question says, first of all, what, what kind of negative effects? You are not even clear, you're not specific about it. The negative, the type of negative effects could be, it could be mental effects, it could be a social effect, is there a physical effect? The question isn't concise enough, neither is it specific enough. So it's very important that we guide our residents even in um, discussing these research topics, to hone them out, make it specific, make it concise. It makes your methods also easier because you know exactly what you're going to look out for. So let's say I rephrase the question and say, what impact does choosing an OBGYN as a specialty have on intimate relationships? It does two things. One, I am not already prejudging the fact that carrying, choosing OBGYN is negative or is providing negative effects. There may be positive effects that you may be missing out if you don't ask the question right. So just saying what impacts will capture both the negative and the positive effects. But then also, I'm also becoming more specific because I'm looking out for the effects on intimate relationships. And so it's very important that we guide them as, in, as they hone or shape their research questions to make it very specific, make it concise, then when they are collecting data, they know exactly what information to seek. When they are setting the, searching the literature, they also know exactly what they are looking out for. And then also when you provide an answer to this question, the answer doesn't sound ambiguous. You know exactly what you're talking about and it makes the work much, much easier. So for example, I ask a question. Does hydrogen peroxide used as a pre-treatment treatment mouthwash in asymptomatic COVID patients reduce the viral load of SARS-CoV-2? This question is pretty specific. It's clearly telling me what I'm going to be using, like the agents I'm going to be using, and in what form I'm going to use it. Because hydrogen peroxide may be used as a nasal spray, it may be used as a nasal lavage, but I'm being very clear and specific about it. I'm also clear and specific about in which population, that is amongst asymptomatic COVID-19 patients, and also about the effect. So those questions have to be pretty clear and precise so that finding an answer to it is easier, first of all, and then you know that the answer you find to it will also not be ambiguous. The other thing that a good research question should do is the fact that it should be feasible. And Prof. Adani talked about it a little bit, but our residents just have about a year or two to go about to finish this. So as much as possible, 
they need to, in choosing research topics, they need to figure out, is this a topic I can finish within the time, the stipulated time and ha I have using the resources available? And that's very key. So you can imagine that if somebody goes out to set out a question that will require using a longitudinal study, does smoking cause lung cancer? And that would involve looking out longitudinally out for patients who are, and it's a prospective study, looking out for patients who develop lung cancer the way. They will finish the whole, the whole term of the residency will expire without them even, may not, they may not have even collected one sample or um, participant for the study. So feasibility is very, very important. And I realize that a lot of our residents are very zealous, very committed, wanting to do gigantic novel things. And sometimes you also don't want to dampen their expectations. What you need to do is shape them so that they don't feel like um, you are putting them down, but it's just a good idea to give them a realistic expectation of what, what to do and what to expect as they go on. Can there, can there be enough patients to carry out the search? That's also another very important thing they need to look out for. When especially they are studying rare conditions, you need, they need to ask themselves, is this study gonna be feasible enough? Is it going to be, are the conditions of this study going to be too restrictive? Those are some of the questions that they need to look out for. Currently, I'm dealing with one right now. I wrote up, we wrote up a team, we wrote up a proposal to carry out a study on COVID. We got the grant, we started the study, and lo and behold, COVID decided to run away. The second wave appeared, and even the second wave, it was such a short peak that realistically, it's not feasible enough to get patients to be able to do a good job that you'd want to do. So sometimes they need a big brother somewhere to guide them to think through the topics that they've picked, to figure out, is this feasible enough? Is this doable? Is, it re is this researchable? And those are some of the questions they need to ask as they um, pose their research questions. Can the main events be observed? So I decide I want to study what happens after death. And I really want to know. It's, of course, it's very important. You want to know what happens after life after death so you know how to live your life. But what does it involve in figuring out what happens after death? I can only research that when I die. And after I found that answer to that question, I can't come back and share my findings. So it may not be a very, though it's a very valid question to ask, it may not be a very feasible research topic to carry out. Another thing I really walk through, my, that's good to walk through your residence with is after you've posed that question, what will be done with the answer? Is that answer, answer first of all, can that answer, is, is it valuable? Can anything be done with it? Diagnostically, therapeutically, prognostically, socially, even providing policy. Can there be something valuable done with it? So I ask a question, can I have ivermectin cure COVID? And it's a topical issue right now. And so I can imagine that if anybody was supposed to come with a cure or even neem tree leaves cures COVID, you can imagine it would be so valuable for everybody because that, um, therapeutically it solves one huge problem we have in that sense. And I'm sure it will affect all of those other challenges too. So those are some of the questions you really want to look out for. Having said that, you also need to guide them as to certain research questions that they have to avoid. Some questions can be a no-no. And those are some of the, those are the, the pretty controversial topics. There are certain topics that can be very um, misconstrued, either religiously, politically, and it will be so sad to have done a very good research, carried out great research, and then somebody takes offense by either something that was done or was controversial. And because of that, all of that research is knocked down just because of that controversy. So as much as possible, as we guide uh, residents, let's, let's, let's steer them. Or there are ways to change it so that it, it, it reduces the, um, the controversy about it. it would be a good one to do. Avoid hard to investigate topics or subjects. And then also if their topics have already been proven, it doesn't make sense to do it again. And you know, the residents have a nice way of going about it. They come and say this study has been, insulin has been found to be um, effective in reducing diabetes. But unfortunately it was done in US and it was done in the European countries, but this study has not been done in Africa and hasn't been done in Ghana. And therefore I have to do this in Ghana to prove that it has been 
for such things, they have to justify exactly why it has to be done in Ghana. The mere fact that it hasn't been done in Ghana doesn't mean that that, has, that topic has to, or that question has to be answered here too. Insulin is insulin, physiology is the same. But if it can be able to justify that amongst Ghanaians, there's a peculiar issue amongst Ghanaians that makes us unique, such that the insulin that doesn't work in amongst Americans may be different from us, then it may be a question to do. However, let's, let's engage them to provide more unique questions. Let's avoid very highly technical topics, especially for our fellow uh, uh, residents, because as much as possible, they should be able to, it should be within their range. When it's too technical, and a lot of their study doesn't, or a lot of their things they need to do to answer the question is out of their range. It tends to frustrate them a lot on the way. So let's look out for that. And then let's also avoid very vague subjects or subjects that there are no information, or there's no available information about. It makes their work very difficult. And even the discussion and even the literature review becomes a challenge. So let's avoid those those. So where can we find research questions or how do we guide them? Most residents sometimes, especially when they have challenges, tend to want to come in for you to spoon feed them. So they come and say, this is my area of topic. What do you think? One of the things you also want to do is make them involved in the research so that they own it. That way they can defend it and, and, and work better at it. So let's, in, let's, let's challenge them to be looking out for these careful observation of their patients. Maybe they notice that certain kind of patients who come into the, the patient, the clinic, have certain kinds of properties or certain unique features. And that in itself may trick their interest to be able to study in a particular area. And that could be a great source of um, a lit a research question for you. The medical literature also has a lot of resources and that usually is most of what we common source of what, where we get our research questions. But for me, one of the things I also want to highlight are journal clubs. Yesterday when we did the questionnaire study, we noticed that the number of journal clubs weren't that many, or the number of residents and, and um, supervisors carrying out journal clubs weren't that many. And I think I'll use this point to encourage us to do more of those. Now, this is vital because as you carry out these research journal clubs, you discuss what is a good research question. You discuss what's a good research anyway. You figure out which research topics have been great. You figure out what has been answered. And as you discuss, you also figure out which gaps are in the, in the literature so that it, it generates critical thinking. It also gives them ideas as to what to do, what to research and what not to research. And especially when it will be in your field, it's a great resource for our residents. And I think I would want to encourage all of us to take advantage of these general clubs. Brainstorming is also very important and key. And I find that as, as supervisors, that's one of the things that we may have to do with them. When they come with a topic, let's not just be in a hurry to say this question is, doesn't sound right. Let's brainstorm. Why do you really want to do this question? What exactly do you seek to answer? Why? What are the unique areas you want to explore? And through that brainstorming, both with you and other residents in that other um, supervisors in that field, we can come up with great research topics for our, uh, our, our residents. So what are the type of research questions? There are basically two types, the qualitative research questions and the quantitative research questions. So the qualitative research just involves gathering data to explore people's perceptions, their feelings, their observations. So it's not really like tangible, hardcore data that you are collecting, but they are very, very, very valuable. There are certain, there are certain things that you can't quantify, but they are, it's information that you can't let go. It's very valuable if you're going to move, um, answer some research questions. Then there's also the quantitative type of research question. This one just asks for data, quantifiable data. So you're doing comparisons, you're looking out for numbers, you're looking out for the effect by how much was blood pressure reduced by taking this medication. All of those are sort of quantitative um, data. And it's very important that we, we blend those. So what are some of the examples of qualitative research questions? For example, what are the challenge, what challenges do Ghana College and College of Physicians and Surgeons residents face in writing these dissertations? 
Now, this is one question I'd love to do, and it will be interesting figuring out what their challenges are. These are questions you can't just send a questionnaire. If you send a questionnaire, most type questionnaires are closed-ended. So it's better to just let them vent and tell, tell you their experiences and what, how they feel and their perceptions. And this you can only answer thoroughly when you're doing qualitative research. What are the coping strategies of young women living with breast cancer in Ghana? It's difficult to quantify these ones. So for these, you may want to answer with qualitative research. Then you want to look out for the quantitative research questions. I'm sorry, that's quantitative, not qualitative. These categorize the data into either describing something, comparing something, exploring a relationship between one thing or the other. So for example, I want to look out for the prevalence of malaria in Ghana. I'm counting the numbers. I want to look out for the difference in daily calorie intake between men and women in Accra. I'm looking out, I'm comparing between men and women. Is there any difference in the caloric value or caloric intake? Then looking out for job satisfaction and salary amongst Ghanaian doctors. I'm looking out for a relationship. Is there any relationship between the two? So by the time I'm doing that, I would have established that maybe if you are highly satisfied with your job, with your job, you are 10 times, your, if your, your salary is, let's say, 10 times more, you may be highly um, more satisfied than somebody whose salary is less. And these are all examples of quantitative research questions. And it's a good idea to go through with them to figure out exactly what they want to do. Now, some questions may need a mix of both, both quantitative and qualitative questions. And so sometimes it may be a good idea to um, suggest a, com a combination of the two. For example, if you want to look out for the experiences and side effects of chemotherapy in breast cancer patients at KDTH, in exploring their experiences, just using the numbers may not help. But sometimes you may find, they may describe their experiences, then to add to it, you can just add some um, quantitative to be able to sort of triangulate the information that you get. And it gets more valuable when you're using these mixed methods. I'm just however going to say that sometimes analyzing qualitative data can be a bit tricky. So it's good that once the, you are recommending these for the residents, they may have to learn the skills of analyzing these data. And you, the researcher and the supervisor should also have some skills so that they don't just get caught up in the middle after they have started. Good. So how do we develop a good research question? Like Prof started with in this in, in picking up a topic. This hones in a bit to what he said earlier on. Let's find out a research area of interest. So let's assume it's malaria. Then within the broader aspect of malaria, maybe I'm interested in pregnancy in malaria. At this time, by then you'd have figured out this is the area I want to do. This would be now a good time to go back to the literature, figure out. What, is the, what are the current issues being discussed? What are the pertinent issues, the difficult issues? What are the challenges that the, we need to address currently? What is already known? And what are the lapses or the gaps in the existing literature? And that would be a fine area to help you focus on it. So for example, after doing the literature, you can now fine tune, you realize that of late, there was, there was this bird nets, mosquito nests that were distributed all around. But no study has been carried out to figure out what's the effect of these malaria nets, not on the prevalence of malaria in general, but on the prevalence of malaria in pregnancy. So you can now hone in on that research question. And now you can ask a question, how, the, how, does, how has the use of mosquito nets influenced the prevalence of malaria in pregnancy in the Shedukateke district? Now, by doing this, you can now figure out, it's, it's a sort of a way of analyzing whether that intervention was even effective. All of the money we wasted in buying mosquito nets and distributing to people, did they have any impact on malaria prevalence? And especially amongst pregnant women, because I'm sure the maternity places, anytime you go, they were giving them free mosquito nets and the pregnant women were given priority. So it will be a good area to figure this out. This is topical. This is easily researchable and it's pretty focused. So based on that, you start broad, narrow down. And I think our role as supervisors will be to guide them in figuring out how to narrow these topics clearly to get a good question. 
So after all of this topic, while do we evaluate a research question? And for me, one of the things I do is when they have come in and they've come with, you send them out to go and bring you three questions. One of the best ways to do is to sit them down together with, with them, evaluate is this research question is a good one or not. Now, after this interaction, they will leave your office already knowing that this question uh, wasn't such a great question. So, and they would know why it's not such a great question. And then that way it also helps them in refining the question to make it a better one. So I use the what, so what test. So what is the question in the first place? What will be done with the answer? Is the question worth asking? Is the answer worth getting? So what? You find the question, the answer to that question, and then what? So I go and do the bed net study and look at the impact of the bed nets and malaria and pregnancy. If I find out it's not effective, then I can imagine that the country will save a lot of money not wasting the mosquito nets because the mosquito nets may not even be effective. Or you may even find out that the mosquito nets, they collected the mosquito nets all right, but they were using the mosquito nets for sieving, you know, when they fry fish and they are sieving it with oil. So they were using the mosquito nets for other things apart from sleeping in the mosquito nets to prevent malaria. So one of the things you do with your residents is to think through with them the research question. Is it great enough? And evaluate the research question. What are the challenges? Is it worth asking? Is the answer to that question worth getting? Then at the end of the day, we can make some progress. So I'm gonna leave us with some sample research questions and see whether it makes sense. Does flossing teeth consistently improve dental health? That sounds like a good question, except that it's a bit vague. What do we mean by consistently? Once a day, twice a day, once a week, once a month. It's, it's not quite specific enough. And what do we mean by dental health? Is it the gum health? Is it the, the teeth, the health of the teeth? Is it oral cancer? What exactly? So sometimes in, in these questions, we need to hone them and help them to focus so that we perfect the questions for them. Then somebody comes and says, are silicone breast implants harmful? But what is harmful? Is it that it's harmful mentally, harmful physically, harmful, whatever? That definition of harmful needs to be more clear, okay? Then I have another question that says, what's the optimum dose of the new antibiotic Cephalexin. Looks like a great question to hear, but amongst who? An optimum dose for a two-year-old may be different from an optimum dose for a 70-year-old and different from an optimum dose for a pregnant woman. So we need to think through these. And then my last question, is the Ghana College residency more difficult than the West African College residency? What is the difficulty? So these are some of the questions that uh, criteria that you may need to go through with your residents to help them go through to figure out and shape it to get so you get a better question for which will be answerable. And I leave you leave you with a quote. It says, "It's far better an approximate answer to the right question than an exact answer to the wrong question." So let's help them shape their questions. And once they get the question right. I believe half of, the, half of the work will be done because once they know what questions they've set out to answer, then looking for the answer is much, much easier. Thank you very much. So these are some reading materials for you, just to guide. Thanks, thanks so much.